Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I decided to interrupt our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study for some thoughts about Christmas. Jeremiah 10, the first four verses. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. And now that I've scared everybody, I want to say that under grace, this is an issue that deals with scruples or faith. Folks, we're not under law, but grace. So enjoy your tree or any other Christian Christmas activities uh, that you feel compelled to, to uh, involve yourself in, to participate in. Just know that the origin of modern Christmas is pagan. In fact, early Christians celebrated Christmas in spring. Christmas is a multicultural, multi-religious festival. It combines sun worship, polytheism, pagan nature religions, Christianity, and other myths and traditions which have actually existed for thousands of years. Christmas is a commercial fusion of diverse nature-based festivals. The 25th of December accords with sun worship that's thousands of years old and the Christmas tree and some of the decorations that we are familiar with are pagan. Even the, the uh, believe it or not, even the nativity stories are originally pagan. Mithraistic, Roman, Christian. In, in truth, Christian uh, Christmas has uh, a whole lot to do with Jesus Christ because of our faith. But technically speaking, Christmas has nothing to do with Christ or His birthday. There are no Christian birthday celebrations in the Bible. Early Christians celebrated Christ's birthday in April or May. It was only changed to the 25th of December by Emperor Constantine in order to harmonize Christianity with paganism. Christmas has now become mostly a secular holiday, a social festival, family event, and a commercial enterprise, but you need to know that this is a matter of scruples, folks. Okay? The non-elect can celebrate the commercial and social event. Uh, Christians can pretend Christmas has something to do with Christ. And pagans can celebrate nature, and we can all be happy and get along. Christians should never... hit this. I can't emphasize this enough. Folks, Christians should never argue and divide over this issue. Whether or not one chooses to celebrate Christmas uh, is, or the, the way that they celebrate it, or if they celebrate it at all, is mostly a matter of faith, as I've pointed out in numerous studies. I've, I have faith to observe Christmas, okay? Many Christians, many of my brothers and sisters in Christ do not. They have no right to tell me that I can't, and I have no right to insist that they do. So folks, don't let anybody put you under law. That holier-than-thou attitude is not Christian. You are not more righteous because you don't celebrate Christmas. In fact, and I've said this on numerous occasions, if you are not, as a child of God, fully righteous, as righteous as Christ, then then you're headed to hell, headed toward hell. Every single Christian has been made the righteousness of God in Christ. So for a Christmas video, I sat around and I thought about what to talk about. I want to start with the second chapter of Luke, the 14th verse. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. We have over and over again in our human experience, both in our own lives and in the lives of those that we meet and we talk to on Facebook, social media, uh, our neighbors, our, in our churches, 
difficult situations. Somebody has cancer, somebody's had a stroke, somebody's fallen and broken their hip, somebody's lost their job, somebody got divorced, and I could go on and on and on with difficulties that bring tears to the eyes. And we're always wanting to encourage one another in the things of the Lord. Remember, He works all things together for your good. Remember that it is God who is working in you both the will and to do of His good pleasure. Therefore, we are to do all things without murmurings and disputing. Dearly beloved, this Christmas, I want you to know the peace of God that passes understanding in the midst of pain and difficulties, a joy that's unspeakable. Sometimes it's, it's difficult to apply these truths to our situations, to human difficulties and tragedies that, that God allows to come into our lives. Have you applied them to your job, to your marriage, your, your, your children? Have you somehow lost sight of the fact that it is God who is working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure in every single thing that touches your life, in the breakup of that marriage or the devastation of a struggle against some particular sin or being alone for the holidays, the loss of a spouse or any other trial that the Lord is taking you through. Christmas, folks, is Christ. As His people, I want you to be reminded of the fact that God has nothing against you. I think many saints down through the ages have had a terrible life, but I believe that they rejoiced in the Lord. I don't know what path that the Lord has asked you to take. None of my business. But the burden of my heart as a pastor is that you'll be driven into this book I want you to know it. I want you to love it. I want you to make it a part of your life. I don't care whether you agree with me or not. I don't have any concern about that at all. My great concern is that you understand that this is God's Word. So many people around you today have a low opinion of Scripture, and many of these people profess to know Jesus Christ. I know there are passages of Scripture that may be difficult to reconcile, but you weren't there when they were written. The Bible begins with a sovereign God who out of nothing created the heavens and the earth in just six days. In a fraction of time thereafter, you've suddenly got sin. You haven't even read anything yet. You're not even to chapter 4 of the first book. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when you finish the first book, it ends with a coffin in Egypt. What a mess. And then we read the entire Old Testament. And the Old Testament ends with a threat of a curse. And we begin the New Testament. And the New Testament ends with, May the grace of God be with you all. How did that happen? Eve was deceived. She ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she offered it to Adam, and Adam sinned. And if I was running the show, Eve's first child would have been Christ, virgin born, before Adam ever knew her. But it may come as a surprise to you. God didn't do it that way. Now you've got a lot of reading to do. A lot of reading to do before you ever get to what people today call a Christmas story the contemplation of the virgin birth of Christ is not a simple intellectual exercise. If Jesus Christ was not virgin born, then there is no such thing as Christianity. There is no such thing as redemption. And the resurrection doesn't mean anything. Lazarus raised from the dead. The one who died was virgin born. He's God incarnate in human flesh. And that's what Christmas is. It is the faithfulness of God and the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, God Himself, incarnate, the one who emptied Himself and became obedient unto death, not only unto death, but the death of the cross, the death of a criminal. Easter's resurrection. Christmas is death. The virgin born 
Lord God Almighty was born to die. He died in your place, and if He died, you cannot die. And as we look at the Greek, we read, And suddenly there came with the angel a multitude of the host heavenly, praising God and saying, not singing, saying, Glory in the highest to God and on earth peace among men with whom He is pleased. Not all men, as tradition would suggest. This is speaking of we who know the peace of God. The text in no way suggests that we believe God is just somehow hoping and wishing and you know, hoping beyond hope that the world will somehow work out some plan of peace for itself. That This is His desire for all men. Folks, this is a love letter to you and to me. The verse has nothing to do with world peace. That is not what the Greek says, nor is it what the majority of translations say. The text is telling us that God is pleased with every single last one of His children. And folks, I can't think of any greater gift our loving Heavenly Father could put under our tree than that. And I want you to know that more than anything, I want you to believe Him concerning that. I believe the faith that you have in Jesus Christ was a gift from God. It isn't your faith. If it were your faith, you don't want it tested through trial. The trial of your faith, which is more precious than gold, that perishes. A faith that is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Is your faith that good? Does that verse say that if you, if you really have good faith, then you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And if you don't quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, well, then your faith really wasn't all that great. Or do you realize that the faith God gave you is a faith that quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked? Faith is built on truth. Don't live in a pit of contradiction. There are no contradictions in this book. God does not contradict Himself. The Scriptures declare that He's forgiven you all sin. That's it. All. And the reason that your sins are forgiven is because of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God who died in your place. And since He died in your place, you stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight this Christmas. And there are surrounded, you know, among us and surrounding us Christians who say, if you did that, if you do that, if you do this, if you do that, then God's wrath is going to fall on you. And if you believe that, folks, then you don't believe your Bible. Christ is the propitiation for our sin. What does that mean? It means that God can't be angry with you. If you see any verse where God's wrath is mentioned, where God's wrath is against someone, it is not you or He's not the propitiation. One or the other. And I'll tell you that thousands of Christians, if not millions, live with those contradictions all year long, up to and including Christmas. If your faith fails, it was not the faith God gives. Because He says after He has tested you, you shall come forth as gold. Failed faith by its very nature is not real faith at all. Faith is faith. We fail because we don't have all faith. But God is faithful because He's the Son of God and because He died in your place. He is a propitiation for your sins. Therefore, God cannot be angry with you ever, ever. God cannot hold it against you or you don't understand propitiation. If it's my faith, 
I don't want tribulation. I don't want trial and testing. If it's my faith, I don't want it tested. But if it's the faith that God gave me, it's no wonder the Holy Spirit tells me to rejoice in tribulation. We rejoice in trials. We know that tribulation works patience. Our trials please our Heavenly Father. We see the tribulation, the difficulty, the suffering that comes. Why shouldn't we rejoice in that? It seems to me, if I could put myself in God's position for a moment and just look at the prayers that are sent heavenward, they're 99% complaining and they ought to be praise and thanksgiving. If it pleases God that you suffer tribulation, shouldn't you rejoice in it? I tell you that you can rejoice in all things here. You stand before Him without spot and without blemish. That He has forgiven you all sins and all trespasses. That He is a propitiation for your sin. And when the angels spoke, they didn't mean peace between the United States and Russia or United States and Iran. Christmas, folks, should be a reminder that God has nothing against you. Sue and I so wish you all a very blessed Christmas season. I began these studies after the Revelation 12 sign absolutely persuaded me that verse by verse study was the only way to proceed. And you who have been following this ministry have caused me to study more diligently than I ever thought that I would. The encouraging messages I've received from you, emails I've received, comments that I've received from you have been a great part of my life. I love you all dearly. And if the Lord wills, I will continue teaching verse by verse. Your love and support has meant more to me than I am able to say. And I am certain that I have grown more in the Lord by your help than you have by mine. I know I've expressed it poorly, but I want you to know that I love you from a pure heart, fervently. I can honestly say I have given counsel, aid, and support when the need was made apparent to me. And I pray that I have not corrupted anyone. Like Paul, I also have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, His person and His work, words that are burned upon my heart. And for as long as we are here, I have no other message to preach. But I sometimes wonder, you know, have I declared all the counsel of God? I can argue with great confidence. I may not be right, but I think I am. There is, in, in my opinion, no one in the universe that believes in the sovereignty of God more than I do. And as we get ready to enter a new year of prophetic significance, I cannot say that I will leave this earth without any concern. Not concern about His work but about mine, not about his responsibility, but about mine. I strive every message to teach in, in such a way where that Christ is exalted and the Father is glorified in the Son. It's an awesome responsibility to be one who teaches. And I constantly ask myself if I have handled his word in such a way that I did not use it to support my own personal convictions. Questions like these have, have pummeled my mind for most of my life since I began teaching in 1987. I have other concerns. What lies ahead for our nation, our world, and our lives before our Lord returns. And I know many of you share those concerns. 
how some of you will fare amidst the almost certain opposition you'll receive from those who ridicule and reject truth, which has only recently become new to you. And though there may be some failure of trust on my part, I would argue that these are the concerns of most Bible teachers that I've known. Each and every one of you are on my mind from the time I awake until the time I sleep. I don't know if we'll see another Christmas, folks, before Christ returns. I just want you to know how much this Christmas belongs to you. Not to a world that views it as the best marketing season of the year. Believe me, I know that God is sovereign. That is not my concern. My concern is for you, that you would know that He is, that, that He works all things together for your good because of the love of Christ that He has shown in your heart and that He has nothing against you, that He has made peace with you through the blood of the cross, not because of anything that you did. I've seen lives changed. I want you to know again that if I have been a blessing in your life, you've been more in mine. My prayer is that this wonderful fellowship between us continues into the new year. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.